So I'm going to focus primarily on the Caribbean, but my backdrop is, is the larger landscape that, uh, excuse me, I'm going to focus primarily on Florida, but my backdrop is the larger landscape that Florida exists within, which is the Caribbean. There are over 35 countries in the region. Most of these countries have major fishery economies uh, and billions and billions of dollars actually around the Caribbean, as well as in Florida, directly attributable to fisheries and their health. So this is the outline. Uh, I'm going to be kind of ambitious here. Uh, there's going to be three sections. The first section, climate change in the oceans. I apologize. There's a fair amount of science in it. But this is science that anybody can follow uh, pretty much. And it's really important. Uh, worry not. We will start to pull out of that in the second two sections. And the last section will focus on the, the back end and what we can do. Next, please. Uh, I want to go back real quick, sorry. Look at the very bottom of this slide. Uh, the glass can be half full or half empty. Uh, I remain an optimist. My glass is half full. It's very easy, they say, to go from climate, uh, climate denial to climate despair. Uh, I'm not yet in the despair mode, and I'm fighting that mode. There are things we can do that will matter, at least for our grandchildren, and in some cases, closer to home. So you can be, the glass is half full, the glass is half empty. I, I lean towards uh, the former. So core attributes of climate change. This is extremely challenging stuff. Uh, this involves a merger of multiple geophysical sciences. To really do this, you have to be familiar with many very complex uh, realms, meteorology, atmospheric chemistry, geology, oceanography, ice sciences, not only current, but the, the paleo perspective on many of these sciences as well. As well. Uh, in the last 20 years, many new disciplines have arisen out of the focus on climate change. There are many journals that did not exist and only came into existence because of all of the integrated mergers going on. The point is it's okay if it makes you a little motion sick. Um, and of course the folks that are fighting climate science take advantage of the complexity of it. Many effects are non-linear and co-vary, and that's important, the second bullet, thank you. Uh, a change in A can change B and H in very complex ways, or Z. I can go change D, and N is going to change in ways that no one yet can predict with their models. Okay. Uh, however, the resolution ultimately for the, the scale we're talking about is fine. Uh, finally, just as an example of how complex these systems are, a lot of folks aren't aware that uh, you know, liquids, of course, you all are aware that liquids are fluids, but air is also a fluid. Air is a fluid, geophysically. Air behaves like water. If you scale it down and think about it, when you're looking at these uh, satellite images of storms and such, well, drop some dye in the water in a sink and pop the plug. You're seeing the same thing. Uh, the atmosphere is a fluid, like the ocean. Next. So a wonderful resource is the, the NASA climate website. It, you, all you need to do is go to Google and type NASA climate. They haven't taken this down. They haven't uh, mitigated it uh, in any way that I can see. An extraordinary research uh, resource, climatenasa.gov. And there's a bunch of real-time numbers on things like uh, sea level rise and carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So there's a variety of real-time data, and then you can go get the metadata behind it from this website. There's also a variety of very important resources available on these tabs, whether you're a scientist or a complete non-scientist or an educator. Highly recommend NASA Climate. There's a scientific consensus tab on the top left of the tabs if you click, click facts. And the scientific consensus tab is kind of remarkable. Um, the consensus on climate change among leading scientific organizations and societies. And this is very important because whether it's the American Medical Association, 
the Geological Society of America, the American Freaking Physics Society, the American Meteorological Society. It goes on and on and on. Every blue ribbon organization of the most prestigious scientists in the world, in this country and every other developed nation, all of the societies have statements that they put out saying, one, the world is getting warmer, two, the sources are man-made largely, and three, we need to act. What we are doing at a societal scale is completely ignoring every aspect of what the sciences are telling us. I urge you to be familiar with the consensus page on the NASA Climate website. It's really quite remarkable. And there's many more that I didn't put here. So, burning of fossil fuels produces inflows into the atmosphere of unprecedented megatons of carbon. We use the term megaton. Megatons are how you describe the energy and heat within nuclear explosions. The problem is that in these pictures you can see some CO2, but we typically don't see it. Uh, I've seen very, very experienced people, much more experienced than I. Thank you, Dr. Baker. I haven't spent my whole life doing this. There are people who have, and you know, you'll often hear after the third beer, geez, God, man, I wish CO2 was green or blue. And you could see it coming out of your, out of your tailpipe. But it's not. It's invisible, largely. It's not only CO2, there are a variety of greenhouse gases, GHGs, CO2 is, very, is the most prominent. You've also may, maybe heard of methane and others. Uh, these gases, they trap extra heat while they're in the atmosphere. That is the greenhouse effect. If you roll up the windows in your car during the summer and you get in your car, if your windows are up and your neighbors aren't, you're expect, experiencing the greenhouse effect. With residence times of over 100 years for CO2 and 15 years for methane, they build up in the atmosphere. So you will often hear that, especially for CO2, the, the, the heat is baked in. Uh, when I drive away from here and my exhaust pipe of my Kia uh, spits out all the CO2 molecules at will, they will be residing, if they stay in the atmosphere, they'll reside there for over 100 years. Okay? So that's why they say it's baked in. Uh, methane. Fortunately, only 15 years, the problem that some of you might know about methane is that it actually, per unit volume, methane traps more heat than CO2. And one of the little secrets about natural gas, which is a step forward by some measures, is that there's a tremendous amount of methane release with the, the harvesting and, and processing of natural gas. The result is that the, word, the Earth is heating up rapidly. Uh, NOAA, I believe it's uh, 17 of last 18 years are the hottest recorded globally. There's so much I could show. I'm actually, it's going to seem like a lot, but I'm, I'm actually truncating this. This is an extremely important figure uh, from the CO2 Information Analysis Center. Uh, the horizontal x-axis is years from 1850 to uh, 20, I believe, 14. And then importantly, the y-axis is millions of metric tons, gigatons of carbon per year. You can see that the rise in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere correlates almost directly with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was a wonderful thing. Those folks didn't know until quite recently that there was a, there was a hidden cost to this. Um, you can see that there's various sources of CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, but what you can also see is this rapid, rapid, continuous increase. So each year, we're, we're increasing often, uh, you know, good year economically, you can expect to see a 4 or 5% increase over the last year of CO2, uh, CO2 releases. So if you've got 9,000 million metric tons of carbon in year X, and the economy is doing good, then in year Y, you're going to take that and multiply it by 0 0.05 and then add that product to the, the original, and you've got another you know, half, a, half, a, uh, half a million uh, metric tons. Okay? So what folks have been trying to do for the last like, 20, 30 years is just advance ideas where we can make the slope of these lines not as steep. Just bring the slopes of the lines down. That has a lot of meaning.
it's not too late to do that. You guys remember a guy named Jimmy Carter? Does anybody remember the 1977 speech from the Oval Office of the White House on our energy crisis that Carter gave? Carter gave a televised speech from the Oval Office in 77, laying out a seven-step plan to retrofit the U.S. economy. 77. I watched it. He used the phrase. He said that this is the moral equivalent of war. Anybody remember that phrase? I remember, I was a college kid and I heard that phrase and I just thought, the moral equivalent of war, that's going to get people going on this. Two days later, the press was swarming with pieces about Carter's meow speech. They took that great phrase, the moral equivalent of war, the marketers who work for the fossil fuel industry and other industries, and they turned it into Carter, the little, the little pussycat talking about his meow plans for America's future. So it's important to remind people, 77, we had an Oval Office speech on this, laying out a plan that was completely ignored. If you don't remember that, you can actually look it up still. So, okay, you saw that last slide. This is another very important slide. These are two of the, of the tipping point slides, if you've only got a couple of slides to show somebody. So again, here, time is on our uh, x-axis, but it's greatly expanded. We're going back 400,000 years here. And then the CO2 concentration in parts per million of the atmosphere is on the vertical y-axis. Well, really interesting, yes, there are relatively periodic fluctuations in CO2 concentrations for the prior 400,000 years, but notice, it never goes above 300 parts per million. There are no records of CO2 on this planet ever being above 300 parts per million. Um, at least for the last, it's actually not 400,000, it's actually something like 800,000 years. What we've seen is since 1950, it's gone off the chart. It's gone straight up in terms of relative increase in the trend. And so now, some of you who have the great misfortune to work this as a living might know that we're over 400 parts per million now, right? You guys know that? We're going up like three parts per million annually. It's going to be 450 parts per million while, uh, in, in, in 20 more years. It wasn't over 300 parts per million, meaning the world didn't have the heating mechanisms forced upon it that it has now um, for over 800,000 years. The data behind this, the data behind this has been attacked from every angle possible, starting with scientists. We attack our data honestly. And this is continuously still ignored. You can go to many websites on the web where they'll show figures like this, and they'll have arrows and X's, and they'll say that it's wrong. They is never a credible atmospheric scientist who does this for a living, who's not funded by corporations or the fossil fuel industry. So we keep putting up data that's really, really not worthy of being attacked further, and it keeps having no impact. Bing, that's really important, guys. It, it, it. Guess what? You younger folks, uh, you'll get to see a planet with 500 parts per million CO2. And the higher the parts per million CO2, the hotter the planet. So here's the translation to heat. Uh, if you scale now our time axis, it's 2,000 years. We're looking at very different time scales here. And this is temperature changes over those 2,000, the last 2,000 years. It really kicked in about the time of the Industrial Revolution. I love the Industrial Revolution, by the way. People think if you're talking about these data, you're anti-technology. That's ridiculous. I live for air conditioning. I live for ice. What people don't know is that these things are new. So we've got a 2.7 degree Fahrenheit rise in the past 130 years. Uh, 
The level is now above 400 parts per million. Uh, you hear people talking a lot about 2 degrees centigrade. That's around 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of modeling, different groups looking at different things that suggests if we get to 2 degrees Fahrenheit centigrade and we get this up to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's going to be even more complex than it is now to do something. And you might recall that slide that showed the annual CO2 input annually. It's going up. It's going up like 3 to 5 percent annually on good economic years. So global temperatures increased, as I indicated, the last five years were the hottest recorded in 139 years of data. That's from earlier this year from NOAA. 17 of the last 18 years were the hottest ever globally. Can this vary? Yes. 215 was the hottest year on record for the city of Melbourne and uh, Daytona as well and a variety of other Central Florida cities. So we're in a very interesting time now where very few people read books. It's not just the young folk. I'm dealing with these 60 year old people who they want me to send them a four minute video. I'm saying, well man, there's more to this than a four minute video. Send it to me as a video. I'm saying, well man, there's this, there's this short book, 50 pages. I want the video. So it's not only the young folks, but us, old folks, us, us older folks as well are, are migrating away from reading and going deep, deep, deep below the surface. Some issues demand that you go to the bottom of the swimming pool. You can't see it all from five feet below the surface. So we're constantly dealing with that, this phenomenon. Mark Twain had many brilliant quotes. Mark Twain had a quote in the 1870s. A lie can get around the world before the truth gets its boots on. 1870. How do you think that applies now, right? So there's a lot of challenges that we're dealing with. So one of the things that scientists do is we like to put up lots of graphs. So NOAA has these wonderful plots that are very powerful that show all of these different measurements that without really any serious doubt suggest or demonstrate that we're in a, a, a radically warming environment, that it's driven by fossil fuel emissions. Um, but come on, man. Is this, how pe is this what people want to look at out there? You look at cable, you, you flip through from channel 35 to channel 55 lately in prime time on television. What are most of those shows? They're reality TV shows with people yelling the F word at, every, at, at each other, right? I'm, I'm serious. I'm trying to really stretch this. Society could not be less prepared for people to show things like this right now. No one wants this. They're going to turn off. One of the things that scientists are learning to do is to act a little more normal. Okay? I've only recently learned in the last few years that most people in high school, they didn't like chemistry and they didn't like physics. And the mistake that we as scientists have made for decades is that we're so used to proving to people how smart we are and how many big words we know that we've completely failed in messaging properly. And I encourage you to, when talking to folks, definitely keep it as non-scientific as you can. But it's hard because you have to use the science. So the more right we are, the harder it is to convince the common man. The more wrong you are, the easier it is to convince the common man because you can just keep it simple with sound bites and fallacies that are repropagated over and over. So, given a choice between showing this image and the one on the prior slide, I would greatly endorse using this image. So, let's talk a little bit about fisheries and Florida and the Caribbean and some of the impacts. So, when I first put this talk together a couple of months ago, uh, I used a variety of resources. For better or worse, there are so many articles and books now on climate change science. Uh, there are so many thousands of journal articles that go through rigorous peer review on this. Um, I just put this slide up because the scientist in me and the, the average voter would hate this slide, but I, the, uh, the scientist in me wants to document some of my sources. Okay. We believe in things called sources. 
preferably bought unbiased, objective sources. Here's a variety for what you're going to see in coming slides. Here's another example, Lorenzen et al. in 2017 uh, has a list of drivers of climate change impacts and confounding factors in Florida. In other words, you got one thing going on and three other factors may or might, may not triple that one thing, confounding factors. The point is, well, maybe this will sadden some of you, but I'm not going to go through all of these tonight. Okay, I'm just going to cherry pick it a little bit with some of my own points. Uh, there's a lot of resources behind what uh, the slides I'm going to show. So, uh, working with some folks at the Marine Resources Council, I'm on the board, it's been 10 years now at the Marine Resources Council, I've worked with some of their technical staff, Dr. Soto and others, and a lot of other people, uh, I've run this through. Uh, and I'm going to approach this in terms of five major categories of climate stressors and impacts for fisheries in Florida and the Caribbean. Are there other ways to organize this? Yeah, you could, you could organize this a little bit differently, but this is pretty much uh, down the middle next. So we're going to start with ocean heating. Uh, we often understandably focus more on air temperature while paying less attention to increases in ocean temperatures, but 90% of the heat, 93% of the heat trapped by GHGs since 1950 is not in the atmospheres or the atmosphere. It's in the ocean. You remember in high school you learned that the ocean is a heat sink? Remember that? The pool stays warm even into the winter a little bit. Okay, the ocean is a heat sink. It absorbs heat. The great majority of the results of climate change are in the oceans where we can't see it or feel it as much. 93% is the number NOAA has been using repeatedly. Um, time, 90, over 90% 90 of the heat accumulation is in the oceans. The atmosphere, about something like 6%. So with all of this global air temperature increase, can you imagine what's going on in the ocean? Well, we just had, in the last three, four years, we've had three storms that hit 185 miles an hour. That's not accidental. That's because the sea surface temperatures on the trajectories these storms are following are cooking compared to prior decades. And there's no, nothing slowing down these trends right now. Nothing. We had a lot of progress, potentially, in the prior, prior administration. So what does this mean to the animals and plants we love and grew up with in the lagoon and elsewhere? In the coastal ocean, this isn't only about the lagoon. We have these wonderful near-shore waters. Well, hotter water means algal blooms and fish kills, and it has impacts on fishery habitats and other things. So I'm going to break this down quickly. Increasing sea surface temperatures. Warmer water means less oxygen in the water. You could call that A. Warmer water means faster algal growth. You could call that B. A times B, especially if you're flushing all these nutrients into the system, means you will have harmful algal blooms more frequently and you will have fish kills more frequently. If you put hotter water together, you're going to, let me rephrase, hotter water, I'm going to return to that first bullet, I take that for granted, a lot of folks don't know that. Hotter water means there's less oxygen available to the fishes and the other organisms in the water. Okay. So when you overheat the water, there's less oxygen available. Overheated water means faster algal growth. Throwing your fertilizers, bang, you've got wonderful recipes for harmful algal blooms. Okay. And what's happening to the water year after? Well, I'm saying five to ten year intervals. It's getting a lot hotter relative to the last couple of centuries. Seagrasses. I don't. I can spend uh, 20 minutes on on each one of these little mini topics. I'm going to do them in about 30 seconds. Seagrasses. A major review by Short et al. in 2016 provided some of this. Hotter waters will be important stressors affecting many physiological processes in 
plant biology, including the growth of the grasses, the reproduction of the grasses, the distributions of the grasses, and other even more complex combinations of ecological factors. Um, do we understand where this is going yet? No. There's been, I can tell you there's a robust literature, a research literature beginning to accumulate. Uh, hotshot PhD students in labs all over the world are, are hungrily consuming uh, the literature to try to identify some hole that they can hit with their research, and a lot of these young people are doing this, and there's just so much literature coming out. Temperature stresses are most obvious at the edges of species ranges. So one of the things about the Indian River Lagoon is that many of these animals are tropical animals, and they're at the northern boundary. The, the Indian River Lagoon is the northern boundary of the tropical, subtropical province by geography of the Western Atlantic, the Caribbean. And once you get up to Jacksonville, uh, southern Georgia, you start to go into what's called the warm temperate regime. So the animals in the IRL are already at their thermal maximum in many cases. So there's a lot of very complex species-specific issues at play. Higher temperatures increase extreme weather events, which can include more rain, more runoff, and certainly higher, uh, excuse me, more frequent or more intense rainfall events increase stormwater runoff. I don't know about you guys down here in in New River County, but in Brevard County, everybody is obsessing about stormwater runoff. Every city, every county person you talk to, it's all about what can we do about stormwater runoff. Legitimately so, this obsession, and it's not only our county. Ocean heating and mangroves. There's evidence that mangroves are showing northward shifts in distribution with warmer waters. Okay, they're, they're beginning to creep northward. Uh, Complex effects on mangrove forests co-vary with sea level and extreme rain and wind events. Dr. Harold Wanless from the University of Miami has a variety of very important papers about how mangroves in the Everglades are being affected by some of these factors. Um, extreme weather will add stress through direct physical damage and hydrologic changes. Both losses and gains to marine plants can result from ocean heating. So one of the funny things about climate change is that some things, there are winners as well as losers, right? Uh, not only among plants, but also among societies and economies. Like right now, there's an unbelievable opportunity to go make your millions in, uh, in the Arctic Circle. Uh, the loss of uh, summer sea ice in the Arctic Circle, which is proceeded much faster than we thought, meant that you don't have to worry about finding a Northwest Passage anymore. That whole issue went away. So you can ship your stuff from Norway to New York a lot cheaper. Uh, there's people talking about uh, sun and sand beach tourism in Alaska and Canada. Uh, <clears throat> our children and our grandchildren are going to see an amazing future in which some parts of the world, by some measures, are going to show, quote, positives. Uh, the same applies to some animals and plants. For example, there can be increases in productivity due to higher CO2 levels, yet negative consequences from other physiological and hydrological stressors. Damn, it just gets more complex. But when you look at the sum total of everything, the sum total is negative often for the countries that are least prepared to handle it. You know, where things are going to maybe be kind of interesting, and there's going to be economic opportunities, it's the, it's the northern hemisphere. It's not the tropics. It's not places like the Bahamas, or Africa, or South America. At least most of those, uh, most of the areas in this continent. Real quick, coral reefs. <coughs> Corals are animals that build cars of calcium carbonate skeletons, limestone skeletons. They do this with some really wonderful chemistry. Uh, resulting reefs have extremely high ecological and, mon and monetary value. Corals coexist with the photosynthetic algae. They are codependent. They need each other. The coral needs the algae and vice versa. Um, bleaching occurs. You might have heard of coral bleaching when the corals turn white. Bleaching occurs when warmer water causes the coral to release those algal partners. Okay, so what you have is a situation like here, 
where the zooxanthellae, that's the name of the algae, and a healthy coral are present in the tissues of the coral itself with unusual heat events. The zooxanthellae are expelled from the coral tissue, and you see a white skeleton. Uh, the good news is that a bleaching event does not guarantee mortality of the coral, but it is a stressor, and waves of repeated bleaching events will kill those corals, which then are typically covered almost uh, well, in very rapid manners by algae, which present, prevent new corals from coming in, and you've got the conversion of the coral habitat to yet another algal-covered turf line. Uh, with the tremendous loss of biodiversity and economic as well as ecological value over time. Perhaps you've heard about what's happening in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, there were a lot of very good papers where scientists were trying to not be, you know, doomsdayers. And uh, what we're seeing is that there are bleaching events in the Great Barrier Reef that, are, that exceed what was predicted on this timeline and a tremendous uh, Tremendous areas within the Great Barrier Reef have not only been repeatedly bleached, but now have undergone substantial mortality. Um, I, I don't want to say more about it because the GBR, the Great Barrier Reef, is is a tremendous, tremendously complex system, and I don't know it. Uh, we are seeing the same thing in the Caribbean. We are seeing evidence of this in the Caribbean as well. Uh, does this make space for more diseases for corals? Absolutely. If you take a human and you degrade that human in five different ways over two-year intervals, that person becomes more susceptible to disease, more susceptible to any number of ailments. The same thing in animals. If you keep, you know, if you remember, maybe you've heard the phrase, death by a thousand cuts. You guys ever heard of that? And, and that seems to just be forgotten. Everybody says, yeah, I know about that, but no one doing it. Well, a lot of the people doing the management are well aware of it, but the people above the average managers are just not going to pay attention to death by cuts. So as I indicated, there are a variety of papers that document that bleaching events leave corals more susceptible to disease. And those of you who dive or follow the newspaper may know that there are terrible diseases now throughout the Caribbean, these new tissue loss diseases that are appearing that were not substantial in prior decades, and now they're not only present, they're really reducing the percentage of living coral in many parts of the Caribbean, including the Florida Keys. There's a variety of, of emergency workshops going on in the Keys in South Florida and in different places around the Caribbean to deal with diseases that have shown up in the last 10 years. So how about changes in habitat and species distributions? We've been talking about changes in habitat, but to stretch it a little further, there are so many articles now uh, where people are modeling and trying to use empirical data when possible to examine projected shifts in organismal distributions along both the US Atlantic and Pacific coasts. Uh, there's tons of papers coming out on actual species scale of black sea bass, in this case, physiological responses to warmer water temperatures. Um, depending on the species, preferred habitats may shift to the north or to deeper waters. Uh, some animals, it's going to get too warm. Some animals are going to like it, and they're just going to, you're going to see the extent of tropical species increase to the north. There's already a, ver a variety of, of examples of this. Um, many estuaries with rising sea levels and increasing rainfall events are going to become a bit more marine. Uh, the, uh, you're you're going to see uh, areas that, that had a complex uh, annual cycle of low, lower salinities with higher salinities are going to be just bumped into the higher salinity realm. Uh, a large literature already exists on a lot of this, and that literature is, is, is exploding. Uh, every time I go to the library, there's like new journals that are appearing. New journals are appearing with names I never dreamed of, because so many new sub-sciences are being invented as the research community continues to work on this. Well, how about the experience of fishing? Well, a lot of this affects the experience of fishing, but in talking to fisher folk, 
uh, along the lagoon. A couple of things seem to surface. Right now, uh, it's you know, a lot of people are complaining about when they do go fishing, it's hard to retrieve your line without the hook being fouled by algae. Uh, Worer bait hits the water, the hook is algae slimed by retrieval or obstructed by algae offshore. You might have heard about the sargassum, the increases in sargassum uh, abundances offshore. Um, there's people who fished off of Jupiter and St. Lucie Inlet for many decades who are uh, saying that it's never been that difficult. It's never been this difficult to fish offshore because there's so much sargassum uh, obstructing the ability to actually get a line in the water and retrieve it. Um, people who fish inshore areas in Brevard County who I've spoken with are, are very frustrated with that. You know, if you're, if you're throwing some lure and trying to get you know, any number of things in shallow water, uh, you get that bait, uh, that lure back to your rod and it's slimed with algae. Um, per earlier, some species distributions will show substantial change by mid to late century or sooner. We're already seeing evidence of this in some things. Most prominent patterns seen in species, the most prominent patterns are seen in species that are already near their thermal uh, boundaries. Of course, fish kills way over there. Uh, fish kills are going to continue to be with us and may, can, may become more frequent. Uh, something that I'm particularly interested in is, is what this means to spawning in reef and reef species in particular, but also estuarine species. Uh, spawning cycles in fishes are, are controlled by very complex combinations of, of physical variables. Uh, anything from sunlight, availability of food, water temperature, multiple other factors. When you start taking a table that's existed for decades or centuries in terms of all of these factors, and you throw that table halfway upside down, you're going to have impacts on the way species behave that are difficult to document. Uh, but there's people that are working on this a little bit currently. Uh, look, I think we can look forward to a lot of research on what, what the impacts of climate change are on spawning in fishes. Soon. This isn't only fishes. Earlier I referred to how hot water can influence the reproduction of seagrasses. And all of those invertebrates, all the crabs and shrimps out there, I'm not talking about the crabs and shrimps and the invertebrates, which are much more abundant than fishes, but everything I'm talking about the fishes can apply to crabs and invertebrates, excuse me, crabs and shrimp and other invertebrates. And I'm not covering it all here. Dozens, okay, another category, extreme weather events. <laughs> extreme weather events. <laughs> um, FIT uh, has had to cancel classes together in the last four years because of these damn hurricane flybys. Matthew, remember Matthew? That was three years ago. Irma, two years ago. Uh, last year we were open, okay, then this year we had Dorian. Uh, all three of those storms had, I believe, 185 mile uh, periods. Um, I know Irma and Dorian definitely. Uh, I saw something where Matthew did before it got here. Uh, there are hundreds, or there are dozens to hundreds of connected geophysical systems that can potentially or are being affected by increasing atmospheric temperatures, increasing water temperatures, and all of these other things, these cofactors these co that vary with those changes. Uh, the outer boundaries of these trends can become more extreme. Uh, more drought, but also more flooding in between the more drought. Um, more pulse runoff, various other hydrological responses, uh, more erosion, both in and outside of the lagoon, more runoff, uh, and with sea level rise, increasing incidences of what's called sunny day flooding, when you just have a street that's flooded, that used to be flooded, a common thing down in uh, South Florida. Uh, sea level rise, this could be a two hour talk. Just very quickly, uh, the East Central Florida Regional Resiliency Action Plan that came out last year, uh, I was on the, the the sea level committee, a bunch of people who know more about sea level rise than I were also on that committee. The 
uh, committee ended up agreeing, and the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council is using as their benchmark estimates for sea level rise now this plot. You can get access to the documents simply by searching East Central Florida Regional Resiliency Action Plan. Um, but we're looking now at an upper bound by the end of the century of eight and a half feet and a lower bound of five feet. And this has quietly kind of happened, where now we're talking about by the end of the century, five to eight feet of sea level rise. And having you know, done this for 30 years, we spent the last 30 years saying it was going to be, remember, one to three feet? Remember that? We spent 30 years saying it was one to three feet. Quietly now, it's five to eight feet. Just FYI. I don't think that's uh, on any of the stuff that's on television right now. And so we're pretty confident that there's going to be a five inch increase in, in sea level in our area within the next 10 years. Five inches, next 10 years. Okay. Um, and, and these aren't the Greenpeace numbers. These are the NOAA and the Corps of Engineer numbers. Five to eight feet. It ain't one to three feet anymore. I was driving home from work about six months ago and it kind of hit me. It's like, what the hell? For 30 years we told people, well, one to three feet. Uh, the Keys and sea level rise is an example of where this can be really acute. Uh, very heavy development at low elevations in the Keys. It's easy when you're driving to Key West to not know how densely developed the trailer parks are in the Keys. Google Earth, this is from Google Earth. Um, this is Plantation Key. These are trailers, largely. Okay. So um, imagine something you know similar to Dorian hitting these areas. They haven't really had that happen yet. Uh, many, many, many impacts in the Keys uh, from what we're talking about. There were a lot of very interesting responses being developed to this. If you talk to people in the Florida Keys and their planning department, and they have a sustainability officer, I believe. Um, these folks are really focused on well, what can we do? And there's a lot of engineers and architects running around putting forward ideas. Uh, there are a lot of very serious people talking about a future where houseboats and hybrid water living facilities are going to be a part of the lifestyle of people who want to live in places like the Keys. Uh, this is one of many examples. Uh, these are floating pod communities with, of course, fully solarized roofs. Um, of course, the problem with a lot of this stuff is that it's very, very expensive and it's still a prototype design. But there are, FYI, you go down to Miami right now, there's engineers running all around Miami with ideas, uh, making a lot of money. Uh, a lot of these folks, uh, if they weren't doing it, they, they're working for companies now that spent decades kind of saying, don't worry about climate change. And now these companies are retrofitting to solve the climate problem. That's an important thing to keep in mind. So in the Caribbean, we have all of these different fishery management organizations. These are Caribbean countries. <laughs> There's at least eight different fishery management organizations across the Caribbean. I've worked with a variety of them. And in short, what I can tell you is that all of them in English or Spanish or Dutch or French, they're doing climate change planning. For us, this is still, ah, we're, we're in America and we're kind of safe and we're pretty rich. A lot of these countries are terrified. I, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. A lot of these countries are very concerned, not on a time scale of 50 years, but on a time scale of now. The Bahamas have had major hurricane impacts, I think, three out of the last five years. Cuba was ripped, Northern Cuba was ripped to shreds. It had $10 billion US of damage. Uh, $10 billion of damage along Northern Cuba from Matthew, no one here knows about that. Uh, people along the Northern coast of Cuba were just really, really hurt and are still recovering. Uh, you've got these low islands with all of the elevations like the Bahamas that if we do see eight foot of rise by the end of the century, People are wondering what they're going to do. 
You might have heard of ocean acidification. One example of all these strange, super complex things happening in the background. Uh, more CO2 in the ocean. Remember, 93% of the heat trapped since 1950 by GHGs is in the oceans. Uh, more CO2 in the ocean creates chemical changes in the calcium carbonate cycles, which make coral possible, um, making the ocean water more acidic. Uh, there's great references on this. Uh, bottom line is the pH is, is measurably is, is being shown to be measurably declining in, in, in all of most of or all of the ocean oceans around the planet. Uh, this has lots of the potential effects on developing organisms. Uh, the skeletons of fishes, the skeletons of seashells, the skeletons of coral are made out of calcium carbonate limestone. And with acidification, the chemistry doesn't work right. And the limestone doesn't develop the way it used to. Uh, this is a very uh, new field of research, but there are many, many, many papers that are documenting things that are going to not be good in the way organisms develop. For example, fish navigate with little limestone bones in their, in their adjacent to their skull. If those bones don't, limestone bones don't develop properly, the fish can't navigate properly, uh, on and on. Uh, here's a, something, this is the last of these categories, and we're going to end soon. Um, and it's really important to point something out here. And this is from, you know, in the sustainability program at Florida Tech. We have a bachelor's of science degree in sustainability. Students take lots of business. They take tons of science and engineering. Um, and one of the things that we point out is that in order to understand all this complexity, there are wonderful tools from the system sciences. One of the things in system science is any complex system, like a teenager, is going to surprise you. Surprises are guaranteed. I went through a whole bunch of different things here. I can slice them up and go into 20 more things, and I'm not going to cover it all because we don't know yet. We don't know what the next sub-stressor cascading impact is going to be in 2036 in the Lesser Antilles. Okay, A lot of things we're seeing now, we're not... People weren't talking about 185 mile an hour hurricanes until very recently in this part of the this part of the world. Uh, there, so expect surprises. Atmospheric and ocean systems are highly complex in their con in their con in connections. They're nonlinear. Something happens here. It's not a direct path between A and X. The path might have a couple loops. It might stop. Then it might take off and go the wrong direction. Sound like a hurricane? Right? I mean, uh, hurricanes aren't linear. Nothing's linear. Very few things are saying that nothing in nature is a straight line. It's kind of a profound thing. Yeah, leaves have a, but overall, uh, not a lot of linearity in nature. Um, there are processes called emergence processes that are going to spin off surprises as we move forward. We're already dealing with it. Half of what I've talked about, people weren't talking about 30, 40, 50 years ago. And by the way, 50 years for the planet, that's a heartbeat. So the planet isn't paying attention to our time scales. So via emergence processes, is predicted for any complex and adaptive system, whether it's a teenager, whether it's an octogenarian, there are going to be surprises. Whether it's a new puppy, okay. Whether it's a drive through rush hour traffic, surprises are guaranteed. And I, no, I'm not making this up because I teach too much systems science. There are a bunch of books about this. Okay. One of the un, 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 uh, un inconvenient surprises we may see in the next 30 to 50 years, I hope we don't, is some sort of rapid uh, melting of the Antarctic uh, land ice. And there's a lot of evidence that you know, people are putting that at 10 to 20 percent, which instead of a 5 to 8 foot sea level range estimate between now and the end of the century, you could add a couple of feet to that. 
maybe make it a couple of feet of rise in something like a decade, if we see that happen. We certainly underestimated how rapidly the uh, sea ice would melt in the Arctic Circle. So it's kind of overwhelming. It's, it's really, you know, wh where do you go from this? Well, let's talk about the last part of the talk, and this will go rapidly. The wonderful thing is that there's tons of organizations out there. This, I don't know Indian River and St. Louis County as well, uh, but um, in Brevard County, for example, where this slide is from, there are a tremendous number of, of substantial organizations working issues that are indirectly, if not directly, related to climate. Um, from what I've seen, uh, just from the Pelican Island Audubon Society chapter, uh, you folks are, are have a lot of resources here. Uh, it's a smaller county in Brevard. We have 16 cities and Kennedy Space Center and universities and such. But you folks uh, are welcome to use any of these resources. Uh, importantly, the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program has uh, done some preliminary work on this. Uh, Parkinson and Seidel last year put out a climate vulnerability assessment for the Indian River Lagoon, uh, identifying uh, approximately 154 uh, different uh, components associated with climate vulnerability, broken down into a variety of, of categories, and you can see they're similar to what I've been talking about. So uh, this is a preliminary piece of work, but the NEP folks are aware of this issue. Uh, this issue is sitting there, along with many other issues that people think are more important. Uh, I've been asked more than once, well, why are you talking about climate change? We've got to save the lagoon first. And that's a totally appropriate question based on <coughs> the information available to most folks. One of the points we're trying to make is that you just can't take acute near-term Indian River Lagoon health anymore and separate it from the larger, larger climate change challenges that you're coming. So in hundreds of American cities are using a variety of resources to plan how they respond to climate change. Some of them are up there. Um, the slideshow will be made available. Anybody who wants to get the slideshow, can, the, the chapter will make it available. Uh, and you can just want to be able to get to those websites. Uh, it, it makes sense to plan for the future. There's an American flag there on purpose. Uh, respecting science and doing something about this doing something about this is the American thing to do. Americans don't walk away from challenges, right? We take a challenge and slap that challenge and slam it on its back. And for some reason, well, we can unpack some of those reasons. People who think they're better Americans than most climate scientists are not going to confront climate change. When this is what Americans do, we could have invented ourselves out of this and have a new clean economy a decade or two ago. And I encourage you, when you're talking to people about this, don't let them use this, this isn't American. It's insulting and it's incorrect. If we were being American about this, we would have solved this by now or we'd be halfway there at least. There's a lot of money to be made by solving this. There are many, many planning tools, many market-based tools where you use the power of the market, you use the power of capitalism to incentivize the goods instead of incentivizing the bads. Next. One thing that cities in Florida are encouraged to do is evaluate adaptation action areas. The state legislature did make space in Florida state uh, statutes for cities to begin to think about areas that need primary focus for adaptation to climate change. One of the things we're dealing with, however, right now in this economic boom 
um, is the development of all that's left. Uh, I drive along A1A from Satellite Beach to the Fifth Avenue Causeway in Melbourne. All well, you guys might know that drive. There were about 10 properties up until two years ago that were not developed along the ocean. They hadn't been touched for five or 10 years. They were the last virgin ocean properties in satellite and in the Atlantic. Well, in the last few years, I've watched them all get rapidly developed. I'm watching them finish the classroom on the last condo right now. So there's, it's, our actions are confounded by the, the rush to develop right now, and we've got all kinds of requests to, to eliminate or, or, or further reduce and weaken basic uh, regulations involving building along the lagoon in Brevard County. The MRC is running around playing whack-a-mole right now in different cities, rolling out people, using all the arguments we can to try to get these developers to not weaken the rules further so they can buy another yacht to water ski behind what we want to do is we want to take this slope and knock it back a few percentage points. There is a literature that shows the ocean will not be as hot in 50 to 80 to 100 years. We won't have as much sea level rise. We won't have as much extreme weather. Is it the, is it the, the speed we would like to go at? No. Um, but once you start to go in the right direction, it gets easier to go in the right direction. If we were American and capitalistic about this, we would be finding ways to monetize people to go from these vicious cycles to what are called virtuous cycles. Redirect your feedback loops in your economies to reward the, the goods instead of the business as usual. Uh, that result in sh certainly nice short-term profits, but what's the long-term cost? Uh, if you're really interested in the economics of climate change, I refer you to something called the, the, the Stern Review of, of, of Climate Economics. Sir Nicholas Stern, former president of the World Bank, wrote this telephone book size. You older folks might know that there used to be these things called telephone books. <laughs> and he wrote a telephone book size document in 07. Uh, that comprehensively went from A to Z with hundreds of reviewers and experts. And he, this is the freaking, I believe he was the former president of the World Bank, okay? This is not, you know, a, a, a Marxist in a tree. Um, like, you, you see people talking like this, uh, characterized. This guy is a fat cat, but he uses data and worked with all these other people in their statement, their famous, one of the famous quotes from the report is that we're looking at the largest um, market failure in the history of, of, of human economies. Uh, and then, well, there is, it's already happening in some places. So, uh, you guys, there's islands in the Pacific that are now being evacuated. Vanuatu, <coughs> Tuvalu, those are countries that are working out deals where they're going to move their populations to lands that are being put aside in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, is that happening in the Caribbean yet? No. Uh, I'm available at that email address. Uh, we have a 2700 report virtual library available at that web address. Uh, if you're interested in the sustainability program at Florida Tech, the top website will give you a lot of information, and I am definitely available for questions.